weren't singing, I was not her teaching coach or a singing coach. <laughs> I am delighted that we can come together and open the Word of God today. As we open our scripture, I invite you to turn in our text in Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter. We discontinued our week-by-week -week journey through the Gospel of Mark several, several weeks ago to digress with some other important themes and subjects. We're back in Mark. Prior to leaving Mark, we had uh, jumped forward and we had looked at the latter portion of chapter 4, but we had left off a small little segment of text in the fourth chapter, the 26th verse through the 34th verse. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. And while you're turning there, let me say a few words by way of introduction. Most of us have heard the term kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. I've read with interest behind some of the so-called theologians and their argument and their debates in relationship to the differentiation between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. May I remind us that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, two different terms, but mostly synonymous. Now, so that we can bring it down to a little closer understanding and what you'd call the young blood vernacular, let's say that the United States of America is the kingdom of God. I'm not saying that, but let's use that in hypothetical communication. And let's say that the uh, state of Florida is the kingdom of heaven. I live in the state of Florida, but I'm in the kingdom of God. Does that make a little better sense? The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are synonymous. In fact, uh, in many of the synoptic gospels, they're used interchangeably as we study the text. In fact, the Old Testament prophets prophesied that a time would come when the Lord would reaffirm his kingly reign and restore to honor all that are called by his name. In fact, Psalms 103 verse 19 says, and I'll read it for us, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Notice there, the Lord hath established his throne in heaven, in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. God uh, promised that the Messiah would come one day and rule as king of kings and lord of lords uh, from his throne in Jerusalem. In fact, in Daniel 2, 44, a paraphrase simply says, God's kingdom will stand forever and forever. Uh, with this hope, the Jewish nation as a people looked forward to the time when the Messiah would come in his majesty and his might and his power and fulfill his promises of all of the Old Testament texts. When Jesus returns, all of these promises and prophecies shall be fully fulfilled. When Jesus entered into his public ministry, Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, verses, verse 15, the Scripture tells us Jesus came preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, may I remind us... Uh, uh, how is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? How do we determine what the kingdom of God is and what it isn't? Uh, what is the kingdom of God? Uh, Jesus taught his disciples in parabolic form. A parable. What is a parable? A parable is uh, a heavenly saying, as someone used the very clear illustration, a heavenly saying with an earthly, uh, an earthly saying with a heavenly meaning, uh, so that it clarifies it in the hearts and the minds of those that are hearing. We must realize that every believer, every child of God, when we say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, we become kingdom kids. You ever heard that term? I'm a child of the king. Wonderful old song. Uh, Jesus' kingdom, the word kingdom is the Greek word basileon, means his area of rule and reign. He rules and he reigns over it all. All that there is is his kingdom, and he rules his kingdom from his throne in heaven. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns after the rapture, after the seven years of tribulation, and he returns, he will still be king of kings and lord of lords, but he will rule from his throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years, and then usher us in with him to the eternal reign where we will rule and reign with him throughout all of eternity the kingdom of God. 
It is uh, what I'm calling the mystery of the kingdom. Uh, the word mystery there is the little Greek word mysterion. It means something that's previously covered, shrouded, hidden, that's now revealed and made known. When Jesus came preaching, he was revealing the coming of the kingdom of God. He said the kingdom of God is at hand. Therefore, repent and believe. Jesus came preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. So I want us to read these verses together. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word. Mark's gospel, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 26 through 34. And he said, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise day and night, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? He's saying, What is it like? What can I explain? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all the herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. Verse 34. But, I like the buts and the ands in Scripture, but, it's a contrast, but without a parable spake he not unto them. Notice there's a colon there, not a period. And when they were alone, speaking of his disciples, he expounded all things to his disciples. Thank you, and we may be seated. When we think on the subject, the mystery of the kingdom, and looking at this little minuscule text, that by the way, as I've shared with others, I find it fascinating how little is written on this particular unit of thought. Now, I went back to my notes, and I've had the privilege down through the years of preaching through the Gospel of Mark on several occasions. And in looking back at my old notes and the refreshing of it and the re-outlining of a text, I don't know, there's something about me that I like to look at uh, what I have preached, get some thoughts and ideas from my word study, do some fresh study, fresh outlining, and do a new presentation on a text with the same old truth but with a new presentation. And as I uh, did so this time, I was still fascinated by the fact that the majority of those that have written commentaries on the subject of the Gospel of Mark some famous names, if I were to call them, you'd recognize them. Uh, skipped over just as though verse 24 through 34, uh, 24 through uh, 26 through 34, just so it didn't even exist at all. Just uh, leaving it completely out of the text. Now, perhaps someplace, sometimes, because in the synoptic gospels, some of the uh, parables that you find are all inclusive and found in each of the other gospels. Some of them are not. In fact, verses, uh, uh, verse 26 through verse 29 is found only in the Gospel of Mark. No other uh, gospel is it found in, only in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, then the balance of the uh, text and the other parable that's given here, there are two parables that I'm looking at uh, as we teach today. Uh, but the uh, second parable that is given here in verse uh, uh, 30 through 34 is found in several of the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, so let me introduce to us the mystery of the kingdom. There are three things that I want us to see that I believe would be beneficial and challenging, encouraging, and inspirational to us. First of all, we'll look at the growth of the kingdom revealed. The second thing I want us to notice is the gathering of the kingdom reviewed. And the third thing, the greatness of the kingdom recorded. Notice in verse 28, 26 through 28, the growth of the kingdom revealed. You see, Jesus, and I refer to this by way of introduction. I'll read you the uh, verse. Jesus said in Mark 1, 15, The time is fulfilled. Is, not will be, is, present tense, when Jesus gave the words. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That is the 
uh, introduce, introduction of Jesus' ministry as he uh, enters into his earthly ministry that brief period of time, three years of his preaching and teaching. Here with this text, Jesus is still in the same position, in the same uh, day of teaching as he was when we looked at the uh, verse 1 through verse 20 of Mark's gospel, the seed, the sower, and the soil. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And he then has other parables with other messages, and then he comes back to the theme of the seed, the soil, and the sower, as we looked at in verses 1 through 20. But I want us to notice as we think about the growth of the kingdom revealed, notice first of all the planting work, the planting work, verse 26. And he said, so is, so is, what does it mean, so is? It's though he's just gotten through teaching, and he has, and he links what he's saying here with what he's already said in verses 1 through 20 when he's talking about the kingdom, and he's saying here, so is the kingdom of God, as if, it's a simile, as if a man should cast seed into the ground. In this parable, Jesus continues his teaching of the seed, the soil, and the sower in verses 1 through 20 in chapter 4. Notice there, first of all, the sower. Jesus is comparing the kingdom of God with the sower and the seed. Back up and look at verse 14 of chapter 4. The scripture says, let's look at verse 4 first of chapter 4. And it shall come to pass as uh, he sowed some, and it's some seed, fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Look at verse 14. It's explaining the parable that's given in the early portion of the chapter. The sower soweth the word. Who is the sower? It is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the sower that is sowing the word of God. He is the one that is sowing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We understand that the Lord Jesus is the one that provides the seed. He's the sower. The gospel is the seed. The soil is the uh, fertile uh, soil of your heart and mine. And as you uh, recall and reflect back on uh, the study of the sower and the seed, notice in the latter portion of uh, verse 14, but and I say the latter portion, the, about verse 14 through uh, uh, verse 20, and I'm not going to read it all, uh, but uh, it talks about it, and the, verse 18, and these are they which uh, are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of the other things, entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful, and these are they which are sown on good ground, it's interpreting verse 8, by the way. A good ground, notice, such as hear the word, receive the word, or receive it, and it brings forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. It's talking about the same seed, and it's the same sower, but it's the variant soils that the word goes in. For example, uh, as I speak today, as we proclaim the truth of the gospel from the pulpit today, it's the same seed, it is the same sower, it is the work of the Holy Spirit that is doing the sowing, but there are different soils, your hearts are different. Every heart's different. Each heart receives the word at a different level or at a different pace. Some hear it and some walk out and the deceitfulness of the world and the cares of life will crush out what you've just heard and nullify the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some will hear the word with well-meaning hearts and they say, that applies to me, that's what I ought to do, I'm going to be obedient, but go out and get involved in the world, involved in the cares of life, involved in work, involved in different variant things, and as a result of that, it is lost. It is though it is the seed that is falling in some cases, as seen in the first 20 verses, on uh, shallow ground. Some seed that fall on shallow ground, it will quickly make root. Those you see will say yes to Jesus. They will come in and for three, four, five, six months, they're doing everything can be thought of, and it looks as though that it's real. They've been converted. The hearts have changed. But the Scripture says in the first 20 verses, the Scripture says when it falls on shallow ground, it goes down and makes uh, shallow roots. It blossoms up, and as a result of that, the sunlight and the cares of life, the uh, uh, toil, the difficulties will cause it to wither and uh, be destroyed. 
That is the, there's no depth of root. You've heard me say many times where there is no uh, root, there's no fruit. If there's no fruit, there's no root. If we've said yes to Jesus Christ, there's the root that's built into the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's the foundational formation of all that we do and say as we serve the Lord. Notice there the sore, but notice the seed. Shall cast, that's the little word, uh, Greek word, ballo means to toss or to throw or to spread the seed, that is the word of God, the gospel, into the ground. And then there's the soil, as I mentioned a moment ago. In the ground, literally, the heart is where the seed of the word is to be sown. So we know the soil or the ground is the human heart. Jesus uses this parable as of a farmer planting precious seed. Uh, the he must plant, he must water and cultivate, and then the harvest comes. But notice not only the planting work, but notice the patient waiting. The patient waiting. Notice in verse 27 and 28. And should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. The farmer cannot make the seed grow. Did you know that? It's an impossibility for me or you or anyone else to make a seed grow. By the way, that's a mystery that even scientists have not been able to discern and ascertain as to what is the causative factor. And I can tell you the answer is God. And most scientists have not done that yet. But you can take the smallest seed of any type grain or any type material. Any seed has built within that seed the power to grow and to develop and to sprout and produce other fruit. Notice the scriptures talking about this farmer. He cannot make the seed grow. Even the advancement of science cannot determine and make the decision, cannot fathom what really causes that seed to take root and ultimately produce fruit. How does it happen? How does the seed grow? Notice, first of all, it's uh, slow. It's slow. If you want to use the word progressive, that's fine. I happen to have chosen the word slow. It's progressive. It's slow. Verse 27, And he should sleep and rise night and day, and should uh, spring up, spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. He plants the seed. And night after night and day after day, he, if you carry it farther, he will culture and he will cultivate and he'll water and he'll nurture and he'll fertilize uh, that seed that's in the ground. But he cannot understand, he cannot fathom. It's an impossibility. It's a progressive thing. A plant does not sprout up overnight. It takes time. The farmer cannot make it grow. We cannot cause the Word of God to grow in our hearts. It's the work of God that's doing it. It's an impossibility for you or for me to make that seed grow in our hearts. Our responsibility is to receive the seed of the Word with an open heart. Say, yes, Lord Jesus Christ, uh, speak to me, direct my heart. I'm willing to do what you say do. Go where you say go. Say what you'd have me to say. We cannot do it. We cannot cause the Word to grow immediately in the hearts and the lives of the hearer. I found down through the years multitudes of times when I had thought, well, uh, what is it they're not hearing? What is it they're not seeing? What is it they're not understanding? With the mindset, how can I get them to hear? How can I get them to heed? How can I get them to understand? Many years ago, while on the road in full-time evangelism, when the pastors and the churches that I would be ministering in would uh, take me into homes to visit, uh, early years of ministry, I had the philosophy and thought that everybody I presented the gospel to, they had to say yes to Jesus. I think some probably did to get me out of their face. But anyway, that's simply not the case. My responsibility and your responsibility as a Christian to present the word, to present the seed, to sow the seed of the word. It is something that we cannot cause to grow. It is something that if it is heard and received over a period of time, it's going to grow. That seed and that soil takes that patient waiting, and it's a slow process. It's not always the case where a person is uh, birthed into the kingdom of God, and just because in quote John 3.16, they will say, there's a mature Christian. That's not the case at all. It's uh, not difficult to detect and to see a plant grow. You can, once that little seedling comes up, it's an amazing thing with any type plant. You can go back each morning and look at it and say, wow, 
that thing grew overnight. Uh, some plants will go, especially if it's fresh shoots of corn, uh, enough uh, sunshine and rain, it'll grow several inches every day. Especially it seems like it just sprouts up and grows overnight. And you go out and see it as it grows. Uh, but the process sometimes is barely noticeable. In fact, in John chapter 3 and verse 8, and I'll not turn to it and read it, but Jesus is dealing with Nicodemus, and he was talking about the work of the Holy Spirit and the growth and the development there. He says you can uh, see the results of the wind. You can see the leaves blowing, if you would, but you cannot see the Holy Spirit. You cannot see it, but you can see the results. We cannot see the growth as it takes place in the hearts and the lives, but we can certainly see and measure the results. I pray that as you hear this today, you can focus on and reflect back on the time that you said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. And I pray that today you would be able to identify and say, I'm not what I want to be, I'm not where I'd like to be, but praise God, I'm not where I was yesterday or last week or last month or ten years ago that I have grown some. It ought to be the desire in the heart of every child of God to have a modicum of growth in our spiritual walk as kingdom kids. As we grow in the kingdom of God, there ought to be a desire to grow and to grow and to grow some more as we serve him each day. May I remind us, the things that we once did and once said and the way we once dressed and the places we once would go, no longer will we do if we said yes to Jesus. It's slow, but it's also spiritual or supernatural. He knoweth not how, the Scripture says. It is a supernatural, spiritual process. It is supernatural. The growth of the kingdom of God is by and through the power of the Holy Spirit of God working in the hearts and the lives of every willing vessel. Listen and hear me well. The basileon, the kingdom of God, is made up of God's uh, children, those that have said yes to his son, Jesus Christ. We make up his kingdom, and the kingdom grows, and as the kingdom grows, it's as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit of God. It's a supernatural empowerment in the hearts and the lives of the child of God. Just as the farmer does not know how or why the seed grows into a plant, we cannot fully understand or fathom just how God can make a real dad out of a drunk and he can take a pothead and make him a powerhouse for Jesus. Jesus' mission on earth is to grow the kingdom of God. When Jesus came into the world, he came to seek and to save the lost. When Jesus was preaching and teaching uh, that the kingdom of God is at hand, therefore the requirement in the kingdom of God, if it is at hand, and Jesus says that it is, is to hear the word, heed the word, believe the word. It's spiritual. It's slow, it's spiritual, it's supernatural, but it's also systematic. Notice in that 28th verse, 4. The little word there is gar, because. Because the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. That word of herself is a unique little Greek word study. Automea. And we get our word automatic from that word. Uh, the only other place it's found in the Bible is in uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 10. The gates, talking about Peter, and as he started to leave, uh, the gates were open on, its, on their own accord. Automatic. It's automatic. Listen very carefully. We're talking about that systematic work that the Holy Spirit of God is doing. It is systematically. We can see the systematic growth of the kingdom of God, uh, not only in our lives and the lives of others, but on a global, universal basis. And so often we're prone to think, well, I'm alone. Uh, uh, there's nothing that I can do. Uh, I'm by myself, and no one else believes as I believe. No one else is uh, saved, and uh, we're simply swimming uphill and uh, upstream. And so often we think that and feel that, that no one else cares and no one else knows, but there's a systematic process that God is going through in growing his kingdom. I don't know about you, but I'm encouraged with these words because it's so easy for us to get a sense of defeat when it seems as though everything is going awry, especially if you watch the news especially if you watch CNN, CBS, and NBC, and ABC. <laughs> I 
you get the total feeling of defeat. Now, there, there's a little ray of hope if you watch enough Fox News because uh, they are fair and balanced and unafraid, I think is the term they use. Uh, uh, but sometimes it is so easy when we see how Christians are being challenged and uh, marginalized and minusculized and uh, an attempt to destroy Christianity on the face of the globe, and in particular in the uh, past six years approximately in the United States of America. It's easy for us to think, what's the use? Uh, it is over, it is, uh, it is uh, failing, and there's no hope. But listen, I can say that, and I can also, if I can just chase a rabbit a moment that just came to mind. But as we watch what Benjamin Netanyahu is doing in Israel, it should cause you and me to hope. Some says, well, how can you get that out of the mess that's taking place there? If you want to know what God is doing eschatologically, if you want to know what God is doing prophetically, if you want to know what God is doing, look at the little postage stamp called Israel. And as we see what's taking place, Luke 21, 28 comes to my mind, look up, lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. It should cause the child of God to rejoice in the realization that God is still on his throne and God is still working in the hearts and the lives of kingdom kids today. He's working in the hearts and the lives of kingdom men and kingdom women and kingdom children, boys and girls. As we are birthed in the kingdom of God, he is growing us systematically, supernaturally, spiritually, and progressively as we are drawn closer to him in and through his word. You can say amen is all right. <laughs> sure there's a need for us to witness and be involved and sure it's our responsibility as we lead someone to Christ to uh, continue to cultivate and to counsel and comfort and direct and correct and uh, water the seed if you will but it's God that's doing the growing you remember in the church at Corinth that's Paul that planted and Apollos that watered but God gave the growth the scripture says notice First the blade, then the ear, and after that, the corn in the ear. That is the systematic progressive process of the growing in the kingdom. And keep in mind, this is the parable that Jesus is using to explain the mystery of the kingdom, to explain to his disciples, and we'll see what he further says to them in the latter portion of this text, to further explain to his disciples what he's talking about, about the kingdom. When a person says yes to Jesus Christ, he is not mature at that point. He has just started, maybe as a, starting, and you'd say, as a infant, and then he becomes a, uh, a toddler, and then a walker, and then he can sit up, and then he can walk on his own. Uh, he has his bottle for a while, and then he is able to transfer from the bottle to the meat. And for the child of God, and we say yes to Jesus, there's the infant stage, and there's the toddler stage, and there's the walker stage, and there's the uh, child stage, and then the uh, maturing stage, and finally adulthood. And if a person's been saved for any length of time, and he's still on the milk of the word, and has not been able to transfer to the meat of the word, and understand a text when it's preached, proclaimed, and taught, and get in the scripture, and study the scripture, and say, God, what are you saying to me? If that is not the case in your life, you need to check up and say, God, am I truly saved? Because a saved person has life, and life wants nutrients, and wants uh, nurturement, and wants to eat the meat of the word. I just made a little marginal note. How is your growth? How is your growth? Spiritual growth in the kingdom of God is natural if you've been birthed in the kingdom. You can take a baby and as beautiful as that child may be. Now, <laughs> I must tell you, and my bride recognizes that. I've seen people say, that's a beautiful baby. And I've never seen a beautiful baby. <laughs> All of them look alike to me. <laughs> uh, now, she said, I could not say that with our grandkids. That uh, each one, you know, that's a beautiful baby. <laughs> But if you take that baby as beautiful as that baby is and as healthy as that child is, if that baby stays in that same condition physically 10 years later, it's not a beauty, it's not excitement, it's a tragic scenario. And so often with a child of God, a person says, I'm saved, I've been born again, but there's no growth in the life, biblically, spiritually speaking, that is a tragedy. There ought to be growth and development in the kingdom of God. 
If we're not growing and producing fruit, we need to check up and make sure that we've truly been born again. The growth of the kingdom revealed, but I want you to notice in that verse 29, the gathering of the kingdom reviewed. But when the fruit is brought forth, by and by, doesn't say that, does it? But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he, speaking to the farmer, symbolizing in the text what God the Father through Jesus does, put it in his sickle because the harvest is come. I just made a little marginal note. Wow. Wow. Notice two or three things. First of all, the plain warning. But when it is brought forth, when the fruit is brought forth, it means ripe, immediately he put it in the sickle. The sore, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know it's him, know it's the Lord Jesus that's dealing in the scripture in the context of the text, in chapter 4 in particular, it's dealing with Jesus being the sore. The sore of the Lord Jesus Christ, main interest just as the farmer's interest. It's not the seed, not in watching it just grow, but in the harvest. Why do you grow watermelons? To harvest them. Why do you grow corn? To harvest it. Why do you grow beans and tomatoes? To harvest them. Jesus says, but when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come. This is God's plan. This is God's plain plan. Notice that each of us, that one day there's going to be, he's going to intervene decisively and he is going to uh, uh, intervene into the lives and the affairs of humanity. As believers, we must not become disheartened and despondent and discouraged or derailed. God is still in charge. He still has a plan. He's not had to go to plan B because plan A failed. He's in charge. And one day, He's going to reap the harvest. One day, the harvest shall be reaped. In fact, in Matthew thirteen thirty three, And another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. And go up in the earlier verses of that 13th chapter, verse 30, for example, in 13, Matthew, let both grow together, talking about the wheat and the tares growing in the church till the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them and bundle them and, turn them and burn them and gather the wheat into the barn. And he goes on to talk about the harvest time in the scripture. May I remind us, the plain warning is that there's coming a day of harvest. The plain warning is that Everything's not going to be what people seem to think is going to be every day the same thing. Somehow there's a mindset in society today that permeates all of society and has crept into, or may I say, rushed into the church, where there's the mindset is everything is just copacetic, it's okay. Nothing has happened. Uh, I've not been judged. I've not been, uh, uh, nothing has taken place to me. I'm still going my way, errant as it may be. I'm still doing my own thing, as wretched as it may be. And God still loves me. And we talk about the love of God, but we never think about the justice and the judgment of God. We never think about the fact that there's coming a day of harvest when all that has been planted shall be harvested. And yet the scripture here is very, very clear. It's the plain, absolute warning that there's the harvest day coming. Notice not only the plain warning, Morning, but notice the purpose written in verse 29. Because the harvest is come. Because the harvest is come. There's coming a time of God's harvesting of his church, his kingdom, the body of Christ. When the fruit is full, when the harvest is ripe, when the very last soul says yes to Jesus. We don't know the time. We don't know the number. We don't know the day. But on God's plan and God's calendar, there's coming a day when the last person on the face of this globe that's ever going to say yes to Jesus says yes to Jesus. God's clock starts ticking. The church is raptured out. We're snatched out of this old world. And according to the scripture, there's that day of judgment for the child of God. 
It's the Bema Seat Judgment. When after the rapture of the church, we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and we give an account for every deed done in the body, whether it be good or bad, the Scripture says. We're going to give an account for what we've done after we've said yes to Jesus Christ. We're not going to be judged on whether we're saved or lost based on the Bema Seat Judgment. If we're in the kingdom of God, if we know Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, our judgment will be based on what we have done with what God has given us and what he has gifted us in doing. If we've said yes to Jesus Christ, he has given each of us gifts and talents and abilities to be surrendered unto his lordship, to be used in his kingdom's purpose. Fruit. Fruit. Are we bearing fruit? Are we developing fruit? The purpose is when the fruit is fully ripe, or the harvest is ready, and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is made ready, and he harvests his church. In due time, the Lord Jesus Christ will return in the air. And according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, the Scripture says that we're going to be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. Paul said, I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, about those that sleep. It's the euphemism that's used in the Scripture about those that have died in the Lord. Even the Scripture tells us in that text that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord. There's coming a day when the church, the body of Christ, the kingdom part of the kingdom of God is going to be raptured out. He's going to reap this old world and he's going to snatch us out of this old world because we've said yes to him as Savior and as Lord. The rapture of the church is the next prophetic event on the calendar of God. My question is, are we ready as kingdom kids? Are we ready as a part of the kingdom of God? Do we know that we know that we know that Jesus Christ is in our hearts, that we've been blood-bought, Bible-saved, born again? The Lord Jesus Christ is ready to reap his harvest. One day, during the great tribulation, the Lord will harvest the earth again. Every lost person will be in that harvest. It's a sad, sad story. But let me just read you a portion of that sad story. Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 through 20. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud was uh, one sat, like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, uh, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he, speaking of Jesus, that sat on the cloud, thrust in the sickle of the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp, sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sickle, and gather the clusters of the vines of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in the sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God the wrath of God. May I remind us, if you're here today and you said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, it might have been yesterday, day before yesterday, it could have been a year ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, we are part of the Basileon, the rule and the reign, the kingdom of God. And one day, the Lord God uh, is going to say to his son, go and receive your bride. And when he does, the rapture is going to take place. We're going to be suddenly seized. He's going to reap this earth of the bride of Christ. He's going to take us out of this old world. May I remind us, also found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, and following, the scripture says this, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in the field. Uh, but when, uh, while men slept, 
His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. For the servant of the householder came and said unto the Lord, said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then came the tares, hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Listen to what the scripture says. But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both them grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in, the bund in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Very sobering thought. If you'd put it in the vernacular and you look at that text in context, it's very similar to the text that we're speaking of today. But in that context, Jesus is talking about the fact that in the church, you have wheat and tares. You have lost, lost folks and saved people in a church. And the question is, how do I remove those tares? And Jesus said to his uh, disciples, don't you dare try to snatch them up because you'll dislodge even the wheat. But leave them there because when harvest time comes, I'm going to harvest both. One will be cast into the fire and burned. One will be gathered into my barn. Speaking of those that are part of his kingdom, those that are kingdom kids, if you will, those that have said yes to Jesus, we must be patient, we must be prepared, we must be preserving till the harvest time comes. Not only to see the growth of the kingdom revealed and the gathering of the kingdom reviewed, but I want us to notice the greatness of the kingdom recorded. Verses 30 through 34. Just how big is God's kingdom? Just how great? Uh, it is so easy for us to believe, as I alluded to earlier. So easy for us to feel and believe that we're alone, that we're insignificant, that uh, uh, we have no value. But we are not alone. Notice the perplexing wonderment in that 30th verse. And he said, whereunto shall ye liken or compare the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's teaching them about the kingdom of God and what it means. And in doing so, he now asks a profound question. If you would put it in the young blood vernacular, he says, Hey guys, what would you compare the kingdom of God to? How would you compare it? What would be the analysis formula that you would use to determine the size of the kingdom of God? Jesus challenges us then uh, to compare his kingdom. And in comparing it, what do we compare it to? What would you compare it to? Would you compare the kingdom of God with some huge magnificent structure? Would you compare the kingdom of God with the world's greatest wealth? Uh, what about anything that you could imagine? How and what would we compare the kingdom of God to to consider its greatness and its grandeur? How would we compare it? What would we have as the analogy to that? Jesus asked the question simply to validate his position that the kingdom of God has no comparison. God's kingdom stands without any rival at all. God is sovereign. He is in total, full, complete control. Not only do we see the perplexing wonderment, but notice quickly verse 31 and 32, the phenomenal wonder. Jesus goes on to illustrate. He's already challenged them by asking the question, stretching their imagination for them to try to fathom what he's saying. And then he says uh, in the text, in the uh, 20th, 30th and 31st verse, he says, there, It is like a grain of mustard seed, which then, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. In fact, in Luke's gospel, the 13th chapter, verse 18 and following, then said he unto, what is the kingdom of God like? And where unto shall I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into the garden, and it grew and waxed a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it, and again he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? He is teaching them the phenomenal wonder of the kingdom of God. We understand that the mustard seed is a very small seed. Someone, in fact, many, many, many years, uh, you've all, I've always seen, always read, uh, that the mustard seed is the smallest seed known to man. Uh, I don't know what other seed would be smaller, 
but some brilliant uh, writer said that it's not the smallest seed. And so he didn't say what the smallest seed would be. And so I'm wondering if he just pulled that out of the air or if he has some foundation for it. But I'm going to say the mustard seed being the smallest seed that's known to man. And Jesus says, take this smallest seed. Uh, too much uh, time is uh, uh, trying to be given to uh, prove or discard or in some way diminish things. And uh, so even our faith is considered to be valid if it's the size of a grain of mustard seed, according to Matthew 17:20. So Jesus is using the mustard seed to illustrate the grandeur and the greatness of where the kingdom of God and its growth will take us. First of all, I want you to think now, we're talking about the phenomenal wonder, verses 31 and 32. Notice, first of all, it's planted, and notice it's phenomenal, and then thirdly, we'll notice that it is protective. Notice, for a seed to grow, to spring up and produce, it must first be planted. He's talking about the mustard seed now. It's got to be planted. It's small, but as a seed, the seed of the word, going back to the context, it's the seed of the word. When it is planted in the heart, it will take root and grow. It's got to be planted first. A mustard seed will not spring up and grow, nor will any other seed, unless it's first planted. It's got to be planted. But notice not only it's planted, but it's phenomenal. Verse uh, 32. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh great, greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Jesus is teaching, remember, the kingdom of God. He has asked the question, what shall we compare it to? He is uh, uh, teaching how God's kingdom, literally the, his universal body of believers, began small, but the phenomenal global universal growth. Jesus began, as you recall, in Jesus' many ministry, began with only 12, and later there were over 500 believers. Peter preached to 3,000 at Pentecost and uh, preached to the thousands, and 3,000 got saved at Pentecost. Throughout the book of Acts, we can see the church increased steadily, even in the faults and the failings of the church uh, uh, that we have today, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the message has been carried around the globe. Started as a mustard seed. We've seen phenomenal growth. It's planted, it's phenomenal in its growth and its development. Remember, Jesus is talking about the greatness of the kingdom of God. But listen carefully. It's not only planted and it's phenomenal, but it's also protective. This is what we need to hear. So that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Theologians differ on the meaning of this greatly. I'm fascinated by reading behind some of them. One says, this illustrates how the devil gets in the church. And... Uh, it is possible that that's the case. In fact, you can look at the uh, text in the context, verse 4 of chapter uh, 4. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it. Verse 14, the sower soweth the word. So it's the word being sowed, uh, the fowls uh, of the air. And in the context, it's talking about the devil coming and plucking the seed of the word. So some refer to this then as saying that the devil comes into the church. And then uh, another one says, this illustrates how Satan will do his work, distracting and trying to destroy the work in the Word of God. Well, that's true. That's true. However, it's my position that it's simply this. Yes, it's true that Satan gets into the church and he'll do all he can to undermine and tear down and destroy what God's wanting to do in your life and in mine. Remember, Judas in the group with the disciples. Then remember also Ananias and Sapphira uh, were among the church at Samaria. Remember Satan also invaded the church at Corinth and was carrying out his task in and among the people. Satan will come to a church. In fact, I made the little marginal note that Satan will come to church every time the doors are open. Just as surely as we're present, the unholy spirit's also present, the demonic spirit to try to snatch the word uh, from you before it dwells and finds lodging place and takes root in your heart. That is true. 
But may I remind us, he's going to attempt to destroy anything that God wants us to do. Yet the great truth about the church and its universal global growth is that it is the church that provides protection and shelter and comfort from the world that is about us. In the context of the text, listen again to what the Scripture is saying there. But when it is sown, it groweth up, and it becometh greater than all the herbs, and the shooteth out its branches. Notice then, semicolon, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. If the fowl of the air would be descriptive of talking about satanic, demonic, worldly scene and events, may I remind us that it's as a result of the protection of the child of God, the Holy Spirit of God that resides in the heart of every child of God in the world that we have today that's the church age. When the church is raptured out, there'll be no more preservative, no more Holy Spirit to provide protection. It is because of the church today that we have a modicum of morals and ethics and values and protection of human life. It's because of the church today that we have safety that we can walk on most streets in our nation with a little safety. You picture the church being raptured out, the kingdom of God's uh, believers being snatched out of this old world. The church is salt and light and preservative and protection in the world in which we live. Remove the church at the rapture and we'll have chaos and confusion and calamity and catastrophe. God is not done with his church. We triumph in the end. There's one final note, verse 33 and 34. Not only do we see the perplexion and wonderment and the phenomenal wonder, but notice the procedure written. I like the fact that Jesus ties up the loose ends, as I call it, with his teaching session with his disciples. And with many such, uh, that word many, by the way, is we get our word megos, it's the Lord mega, it's the megos, we get our word mega. And with many such parables spake he, that is Jesus, the word, that is literally the gospel, unto them, as they were able, I like that now, as they were able to hear, literally, as they were able to comprehend as they were able to grasp, as they were able to understand what he was saying. There's a good lesson there. Every one of us will not understand with the same depth and the same comprehension and the same perception of everything that's spoken or preached or taught. But God has, if you have an open mind and a willing heart, God has a message from his word for us. The preaching and the teaching of the kingdom of God is what Jesus is doing. Notice in 33 and 34, the word is communicated and it's clarified. It's our responsibility as pastors, preachers, teachers, and as individuals that know the Lord Jesus Christ to communicate his word with others. And it's our responsibility to clarify the word. Notice in that 34th verse, but without a parable spake he that is Jesus not unto them. And when they were alone, when they were alone, when Jesus and his disciples were together, he expounded, that literally means to clarify, to explain, to untie, to give the essence of all things to his disciples. Listen very carefully. Jesus is teaching the throngs of people all that day. He teaches this lesson, and the disciples, some of them I'm sure, say, Lord, what are you really saying? So when they were alone, he expounded it. He untied the ravel. He unraveled the rope. He gave the information. This is the reason we have individual units that we call Sunday School Bible Study because it's in those Bible study units where the teacher can teach, there can be dialogue and discussion that the text and the Word of God can be unraveled to be clarified, to be communicated to our hearts in a group session in Bible study. Oft times when the Word is proclaimed from the pulpit, some will hear and heed, some will hear and leave, some will hear and understand, some will hear and still wonder about it. But in those smaller sessions where we can ask questions, we can have dialogue and we can get instructions from the teacher. There's where God grows the kingdom of God in the child of God and the heart and life of each of us as we study the Word. Are you saved? 
Are you sure? Do you know that you're part of the kingdom of God? 